This condition that we now recognize that are called PCOS has been around for over 100 years, uh, but it's only been since the 1990s that we started to realize that a common thread underlying this condition is a condition called insulin resistance. So insulin resistance we know a lot about because type 2 diabetes is the result of many years of unchecked insulin resistance. So the complexity of PCOS in terms of all the hormonal changes and, and all the things that frequently overwhelm people um, can oftentimes be simplified by tying into that condition what people can do with diet and lifestyle to help normalize these hormonal abnormalities seen in the condition. What I do with patients when I see them, you know, most of my patients are referred by the doctors here because they have a nice appreciation for the role of diet and lifestyle in managing PCOS. So the first thing I'll do is go through and find out what their baseline understanding is and then get a, try to get a strong feel of what their life is like. Um, you know, whether they're working, you know, what they do, who lives in their household. And then we really start to talk about the quality of their diet, focusing on the positives first. Um, you know, I'm well aware of the fact that many people are intimidated by seeing a nutritionist. Um, they think they're about to meet with the person who eats perfectly and, and doesn't like food, and so I try to normalize that experience by saying, you know, food is a common thing we all share. Um, so I'm a big 80-20 rule person. I care what people do 80% of the time. 20% uh, of the time is just how life goes because life isn't always predictable. Um, so we review a lot of um, baseline supplement use, whether or not somebody exercises, what kind of family history they have related to medical problems, personal history. Um, weight history is really relevant in PCOS. Um, depending on the statistics, it appears that anywhere from 60 to 80 percent of women with polycystic ovary syndrome are overweight or obese. Um, and that does complicate their fertility and their health risks further. So invariably that ends up working its way into the conversation. Um, but again, I, I never think it's a bad idea to take the focus off of counting calories and fat grams and, and all of this um, weight loss minutiae that a lot of people are used to and often have had negative experiences with um, and really turn the conversation around and talk about, tell me about um, your carbohydrate intake. You know, carbohydrates affect insulin levels and insulin is the hormone that can get in the way of reproductive hormones. So we just talk about what kinds of carbohydrates they eat. What is the quality of those? What is the quantity? How do they spread them out over the day? Um, do they tend to eat them alone or do they tend to pair them with other foods? And I, I'll really use that information to teach them what subsequently happens in their body when they consume these kinds of foods versus things that are more refined and processed. Um, and you can really see the light bulb go off because now they, they kind of get it. They understand that in the moment, in the few hours after I eat, what I'm eating and whether or not I'm exercising can actually change my hormones. And that's really powerful information for people because they often feel very um, lost in the technology, as I said. You know, they uh, are told when to come in, you know, what to do, when to take their injections, when to show up for their tests, and um, it can really be pulled out of their experience. Um, so this is, again, something that they feel like they can do um, to just have some tools in a toolbox to deal with their health and deal with the um, the process of the infertility treatment.